from the hot as blazes dungeon in the Pacific Northwest. Throw everything else out the window. There's nothing cold about it. It's a little dark, as dark as it can be, but we got to keep the lights on so we've got good, you know, lighting for the video. Hello, everyone. I'm Jeremy Scott looking at uh, the 90 degree mark or so as we begin the show. It's certainly been a lot warmer than that. We've had several days well over 100 degrees, and this follows on top of a record trend-setting unprecedented. Throw all of those words in there. End of June heat wave that saw temperatures as high as I've ever seen them in my lifetime, living in Oregon and this climate my entire life, 116 degrees. And then we rewind the clock a little more back to February when we had a, an unprecedented extreme ice storm. And uh, that ice storm was unlike anything that we knew at that time. I was actually away from home a couple of days and then came back home. And after coming back home, I found that the uh, the uh, screen door was actually frozen shut. And, of course, we have extreme uh, heat and extreme cold. And so just the person to have on the program tonight is Jim Lee. And I'll tell you about Jim Lee in just a moment. But here it is. The chickens have come home to roost, friends. It is a scenario in which uh, we've certainly discussed on this program, and it's one that is playing out for all of us to see. Tonight tonight we're going to take the blinders off, though, and we're going to expose what's really going on. Now, I wish I wasn't right about some of these things. Some of these things are downright frightening. Noah reports that July was the hottest ever month on record. Interesting that it was July that was the hottest month on record because the hottest month here was June and now August. So different climates, different regions, different weather. But the truth is that the weather is being manipulated. It's being manipulated to cre- create extreme hot and extreme cool. And then you might get in, well, why is it being done? And it seems it might be being done for no other reason than to exterminate the most vulnerable, those who cannot afford air conditioners, those who live in exceptionally hot climates, and nothing they can seem to do to get out of that hot climate. For others, it's the extreme cool, although usually we don't see extreme cool. Usually, if it's really, really cold, you can put on a whole bunch of blankets, right? In extreme hot, you've stripped off all the layers, and then what? And if you you think it's just, you know, I'm talking about things that don't exist... Well, let me give you this number. The heat wave, specifically the one that I talked about in late June, when we saw 116 degrees here in Portland, Oregon. Never before have we seen 116 degrees here. That heat wave led to more than 500 deaths in Oregon, Washington, Idaho, and Canada. So it's certainly not fantasy. When the power grid takes a hit, and the people who need it most for life-saving devices, say oxygen, and uh, a variety of other medical instruments, heating and cooling, you can't turn on the juice. That's certainly a life-and-death situation. Hypothermia is what happens when you overheat. And that's what kills people. So it's not climate change. It's not global warming, as the powers want you to be. They, they certainly try to ram that down your throats. And I'm not making a political statement. I just know that the weather has been manipulated. That the weather has been controlled. And so when I know it's been manipulated and controlled, and... Alarmists want to say, well, it's just evil man. I, I, can't, I can't go by with that. 
weather modification, geoengineering. That's what we're talking about. They're literally weathering the storm. And so that's what we've called tonight's program. So honored to have back Jim Lee. I know the audience is excited to have him here. He's an expert on weather warfare, has over a decade of research on the history, present and future of weather modification and climate engineering. All of Jim's research websites and social media can be reached at Climate Viewer News, which is at climateviewer.com. He's the creator of Climate Viewer Maps on climateviewer.org, where you can monitor our world in real time on a 3D globe with unique maps, over 600 of them in live feeds. Jim has archived the world's most comprehensive weather control timeline with hundreds of verified historical facts, images, and videos from 1800 to present on his website, Weather modificationhistory.com jim lee welcome back into the paranormal honor to have you back it's good to be back how you been jeremy i I'm, i've been hot it's, it's too hot for my liking <laughs> uh, you're in where remind us where where are you at i'm in uh sumter south carolina that's right south carolina so what's the temperature tonight um earlier today it hit about 89 degrees but it's actually been rather mild this summer um i've been very blessed to uh not have to endure um 100 degree temperature with 100 percent humidity year round um so I'm, pr- I'm pretty pleased but you know you catch the brunt of it on the west coast and you're you're much closer to china than i am so of course <laughs> uh, you're going to be experiencing those uh, highs and lows. <laughs> yeah, Jim, you know, the joke always here on the Pacific Northwest is, well, don't bring the rain with you. Like whenever we go vac- on vacation, we visit family or whatever. And another, don't bring the rain with you because the Pacific Northwest is known for rain. And now we've become known for extreme heat. I, I actually did that one time. I went up to Great Falls, Montana to um, meet with some of my family um the Native American side of my family, my mother's side. And um, it had snowed for three or four weeks. And they, they you know, were calling me like, expect it's going to be like, you know, 12 feet of snow. And it didn't snow the entire week I was there. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I guess you can bring the weather with you. So, um, and so I guess what we're saying here, sometimes the weather is predictable and sometimes it's not. <laughs> Oh, the, the weather is never predictable. Um, and, and that anybody who has a weather app on their phone or, you know, tries to just like, I don't, I don't really look at anything other than, you know, what's going to happen in the next 24 hours. But then what I do secondarily is I always look at the week's forecast and I, and I just, I kind of like snapshot it in my brain. And then as the days progress, I try to judge how stupid these people are. And I've re- literally come to the point now where, like, we go do a beach vacation or something, and they're like, well, they're predicting rain the entire week. And I'm like, that's not a thing. <laughs> um, they have no clue. And um, there isn't a single forecaster on the planet that can predict like wet, you know, cloud cover, for instance. Um, and even in the Iraqi war, I think it was up to, up to like 60% of the sorties, uh, you know, bombing runs, planes going out, doing whatever, um, had to be diverted and returned back home because they got the weather wrong. So if you got, if you got the military with the best technology on the planet and they can't even predict the weather, you know, six, seven hours before they fly out into the desert, um, nobody can. So, Jim, what is your take on the whole situation? Uh, you know, the report from NOAA that July was the hottest month on record, and, of course, the climate change report that, that just came out of late. Um, I think that that's typical. Um they're always going to say that, you know, it's the hottest month on record. It's the hottest day on record. Um, uh, Alan, um, I want to say Alan Watts, what's up with that? Um, his website, Chuck Watts. uh, say that again, Chuck Watts, I believe it is. 
I'm having a brain fart here. I'm thinking Anthony Watts. I don't know why. Anyway, um, regardless, he he just did a, a thing where they were talking about the hottest day on record was recorded in Death Valley. And, you know, he was like, no, actually, the hottest day on record was in 1913. And a whole bunch of people try to debunk that, saying, oh, well, you know, the, the sensor there was bad. And he's like, really? Because, you know, and then he puts up this thing showing how the U.S. Weather Bureau was like, this is the most sophisticated technology on the planet. We've tested it against, you know, sand blowing into it. And by the way, it was, um, it was 100 and, you know, like, I think it was 128, 129, 130 days in a row. So it wasn't just like one day. And he's like, actually, so in 1913, was the hottest ever recorded in Death Valley, and this is all complete BS. Um, and that tells you a lot about, you know, the level of propaganda they're willing to go to to keep pushing a narrative about global warming. Um, furthermore, you know, the people, you know, that are in the know and follow this stuff, they watch the, you know, the ice cams that are all around North Pole. Um, and then they're magically turned off. And uh, the, 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 the funniest one that I can remember was the team of, of scientists that were going down to Antarctica to study the, you know, melting ice. And then their ship got stuck in the ice <laughs> because <laughs> they didn't expect it to be there. Um, these people really have don't have a clue about climate. Climate is an extension of weather. If you can't predict the weather seven days out, hell, 24 hours out. If you cannot predict the weather 24 hours out accurately, how can those same computer models, which are man-made, which have numbers plugged into them from instruments and best guesses, how could they ever predict what it's going to be like in 50 years? Because... There, you know, there are so many assumptions that have to be made to make these kinds of predictions. And that's assuming people don't change. Technology doesn't change. That, you know, we don't plant a trillion trees like, you know, is currently being talked about. Something I firmly support. If you care about climate change, plant a trillion trees. Um, it'll solve most of the problem. Another Major problem is the ocean, overfishing of the ocean, poisoning of the ocean. The ocean is the world's largest carbon sink. If you care about climate change and CO2-based climate change, anthropogenic climate change, um, then save the ocean, save the trees, start there. Um, don't start talking to me about my gas tank because seven ships delivering crap to Walmarts from China, crap we don't need, crap we should make here in America, those seven ships produce more CO2 than every single car on the planet. Yeah. So, by that logic, why are they telling people in Oregon, I heard this, you can confirm this, that they're not allowed to burn firewood yeah. because it hurts the climate? The particulates. Yeah, that their CO2 emissions and, you know, soot emissions from burning fires is bad for the climate. What about, I'm pretty sure that freezing to death is bad for your local climate. <laughs> yeah. So, I, you know, I look at um, these global interests um, that have a stake in climate change, and I say that, you know, repeatedly, the their main goal is to detract from the true climate changers. They don't don't talk to me about climate change if you don't know about the climate changers. And the climate changers are not only these large pollution sources from these, you know, subsidized. They've got you know lobbyists in in D.C. They'll never, ever be regulated. But you, you don't have a lobbyist. You don't have somebody to go to bat for you. So you're easy to pick on, easily controlled and manipulated. Um, so it's all about control, in re really, in the end. And 
they don't want you to know about the past hundred years, let's say, of weather modification, about the current trend of geoengineering, about space weather modification. Everything from the ground to the ocean to um, putting micro bubbles on the surface of the ocean to spraying sea salt from the ocean into clouds to make them brighter to altering jet fuel to make the contrails, chemtrails, plane farts, whatever you want to call them, um, cool the planet, not trap heat, to putting glass balls on the North Pole to reflect sunlight, the ICE 9-11 um, project. The other one was called the Marine Cloud Brightening Project. The, these major geoengineering projects going on around the world um, are changing our weather to a much greater extent than CO2 ever would or could. So I think that it's just all a distraction so that they can create a boogeyman. And whenever there's a boogeyman and people are scared, they're more willing to give up their rights. Uh, that's he- always a bad thing. Hence present ben day. Ben Franklin. <laughs> yeah, insert Ben Franklin quote. <laughs> <laughs> And it's not just uh, it's not just the U.S. Uh, China, particularly, uh, has been involved big in in this geoengineering or weather modification. Um, China is my my number one focus at the moment because of the size and scope of their weather modification slash geoengineering programs. Um, have you ever watched the movie Seven Years in Tibet? Have not. You should watch it. It's beautiful. But the people of Tibet have long endured enslavement, harassment of the Chinese government. And the reason isn't because it's just so darn pretty up there in the Himalayas. It's because that's one of the world's largest water sources. And the Chinese have decided to basically put hundreds of thousands of glaciogenic cloud seeding generators. Let me break that one down for you. The idea is called snowpack augmentation, that they put cloud seeding generators at near the base of a mountain, and the updraft of wind will carry silver iodide cornflakes into the clouds, and that those will attract water, which will then turn into snow and then land on the mountain and then melt in the spring and feed all the rivers and tributaries coming off. Snowpack augmentation happens from October through March of every single year since 1949 in the United States across the entire Rocky Mountains. And the reason why is because... Um, many of you silly people in the West live in places you should not be. <laughs> Oregon's not really one of those places. I lived. I hey, lived if in I could Bend, get out of Oregon, Oregon, I would get out of Oregon any day now. Like a one way ticket. I lived in one way ticket out of here. Yeah. Well, I lived in Bend, Oregon, for a while, and Bend's it was nice. Absolutely, absolutely breathtaking. Yeah, Bend is nice. Um, but. There are a lot of places in in the West where there just isn't water at all. And they require, you know, like when I lived down in Coolidge and Casa Grande and um, Florence, Arizona, um, just man-made canals, hundreds and hundreds of miles to divert water, to bring it to these communities. And all of these are fed from, you know, sources at the mountains. And all of these mountains have artificial snow on them. Um, So let's get back to China. China's putting 100,000 of these cloud seeding generators all over the Tibetan plateau. And then it gets worse. Did you know that China actually has more dams than every other country on the planet? Hmm. I didn't know that till yesterday. And I was doing a little bit of research on this thing. And 
what's really interesting about it is the the Times of India there um was talking about this uh in an article titled this is from April 25th 2020 uh China's weaponization of water and uh this is a great quote from Sun Tzu the nature of water is such that it avoids heights and hastens to lowlands. When a dam is broken, the water cascades with irresistible force. Now, the shape of an army resembles water. Take advantage of the enemy's unpreparedness. Attack him when he does not expect it. Avoid his strength and strike his emptiness. And like water, none can oppose you. And the interesting thing about it is that many of the the, the largest rivers, the, the Yellow River, the Yangtze, the Brahmaputra, um, and the Mekong River, all flow from Tibet. And because of China's dams, people in Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, Myanmar, um, they are literally drying up. And, of course, the Chinese say, well, that's because we've been experiencing drought-like conditions. But they stopped sharing weather data with these countries in 2018. So they're not only creating the water and controlling the weather, they're hoarding it for themselves. Imagine that thought. It's a damning thought. And we'll continue this episode of Into the Parabnormal Weathering the Storm with Jim Lee of Climate Viewer News. Climateviewer.com and .org, weathermodificationhistory.com. It's going to be one of those shows for the ages tonight. An encyclopedia of knowledge coming your way on Into the Parabnormal. I'm Jeremy Scott.
prepare abnormal news. I'm Brad Bernards. In breaking news from the UFO files, on the night of July 30th, the Canadian military and a KLM Royal Dutch Airlines flight reported a UFO over the Gulf of St. Lawrence, according to reporting in Vice World News. An aviation incident report posted on the night of August 11th says both flights reported seeing a bright green flying object that flew into a cloud, then disappeared in a stretch of open water between Quebec and Newfoundland. Few other details were made available in the report, which appeared in the Canadian government's flight incident archive. Whatever they are, these kinds of enigmatic objects and lights have caught the attention of the U.S. government. Canada, by contrast, appears far less interested. In a recent statement to Vice World News, a spokesperson from the Department of National Defense said, We do not track reports or collect information about sightings of UFOs. Think you have what it takes to survive on Mars? A one-year simulation of an expedition to the Red Planet could be just for you. If you fit the bill, a 1,700-square-foot 3D-printed dome called Mars Dune Alpha will house a crew of four starting next fall at NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston. They'll be tasked with spacewalks, virtual reality, and robotic control training, just to name a few. The data will be used to develop methods and technologies to prevent problems on future space flights to the moon, Mars, or other planetary journeys. NASA's criteria is non-smoking U.S. citizens ages 30 to 55 with schooling in a STEM field or at least 1,000 hours of flight experience. The habitat might be bigger than you think with private quarters, a kitchen, two bathrooms, technological work area, and dedicated areas for medical, recreation, fitness, and growing crops. This is Daniel Brewer for Paranormal News. Somewhere between abnormal and paranormal. I'm Brad Bernard's Parabnormal News. Scientists and researchers are looking at how to change the weather change on purpose. The weather. China is now looking at the skies. It has revealed plans to drastically expand on experimental weather modification program. Creating a massive chemical cloud that could cool the Earth. It's called solar geoengineering, and it's highly controversial. Change the, weather. the idea of geoengineering comes about because uh, one might believe or say or, or conclude that either... It's just too hard and too expensive to lower CO2 emissions. The West Coast bracing for what's shaping up to be a historic heat wave. At least 23 million in the West under heat alerts. The heat in the Pacific Northwest burning through records. Change the weather. Sporting a tinfoil hat and looking dang good in it. Into the Paranormal with Jeremy Scott. So the question I guess then I have next for Jim Lee is, is what China is doing, is that impacting what's happening here in the U.S.? Uh, certainly. So are Without we- a doubt. Um, you have to understand the flow of things that basically there, there are different streams in the atmosphere, of course, in our you know our latitude that basically everything goes from west to east um so you you generally get everything coming out of china it kind of rides its way up along japan towards the peninsula in alaska and then back down um the coast right to you guys in washington and oregon um, and that's, you know, what do they call them? Polar vortexes, you know, whenever they have those, those deep troughs, especially in the, the seasonal changes where, you know, you, you get a, a lot of mixing where you get these, these really cold bursts that just race down from the Arctic. Um, think about it like a stream. If you had a stream, say, let's say a foot wide just to make it very simple. And then I took a basketball and I I just plopped it right down in the middle. Big rock about the size of a basketball. That stream would now be diverted. And by creating such a large geoengineering project like they are, um, two-thirds the size of Spain, to give you an idea. Mm -hmm. 
you're you're affecting weather on a worldwide basis. Um, Dr. Jim Fleming, who's one of my personal heroes, um, I had a talk with him about this, and I, I was showing him just the you know just the snowpack augmentation done in America, and I said, would that classify as a Mothra effect, not a butterfly effect? For those who are not familiar with the butterfly effect, um, there was a paper written many moons ago um, that asked the question, does the flapping of a butterfly's wings in Brazil affect the weather in X, let's say, New York? Um, and he you know, commented to me when I interviewed him at the American Meteorological Society's annual meeting, I went to the 21st conference on planned and inadvertent weather modification interviewed a bunch of people who actually control the weather and dr jim fleming was there which just made my life <laughs> not, not even exaggerating um you can see a uh you can see the interview at climateviewer.com slash ams um that'll take you to all the, the interviews i did there i interviewed raytheon um, the United States Naval Research Lab, who was controlling HARP at one time. Um, many, many funny things in those interviews. But um, Jim Fleming basically said, we would need more like a Mothra effect. And he was referring to the giant moth in the Godzilla movies. So I asked him, I said, you know, would, would this be considered a Mothra effect? He said, certainly. Um, and he was just referring to the cloud sitting here in America. Now, you guys are on the western side of that. So, you know, for us on the East Coast, we're experiencing that. Um, when we're seeing, you know, softball so size hail, um, torrential floods, um, just, you know, all kinds of crazy weather, we, we, we bear the brunt of that. But... It's also in combination with the monumental amount of pollution that China puts out and the fact that they are modifying intentionally so much weather. Um, so really, it's affecting our entire globe. And to what extent, of course, scientists will never be able to put a number to that because they don't understand the climate well enough. They don't understand weather enough. They don't have good enough sensors to ever really truly figure that out. So that's one of the main problems that we have is that they don't, they don't really have the, the technology um, to understand all of the intricacies of such a chaotic system. So instead of climate change, I would say climate chaos is probably a better description for what's going on um you know these individuals who are you know into the weather modification gang um they really they're experiments every single one of them is an experiment it's not a project it's not a program it's not it doesn't have a determined output they just hope they're gonna make more rain because as David Kaczynski, an ex-lieutenant uh, colonel in um, the U.S. Air Force, said, um, water will be to the next century what oil was to the last. That we are, that they call it blue gold, that water wars are coming. Um, and we're, 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 we're kind of talking about, you know, um, what was that, uh, that movie... <laughs> it's slipping my mind right now. The the, uh, the doom. Oh gosh, I can't think of the name of it. Anyway, I'm not going to be um, much help, Jim. I'm horrible on movies as far as uh, yeah, my history. Charlie, there, Charlie's there, and uh, my wife would know probably. Yeah, it's a. I had the, there's a whole bunch of people in the audience right now going, "It's such, it's such. Come on, man, get it again." Uh, but. But the whole idea was, you know, they lived in a world where, you know, water, what, there, was, there wasn't any water. Um, and, and that's kind of where we're headed. You know, they actually, the, the United States Bureau of Reclamation has had a map up called Water 2025. And it actually showed areas of conflict 
over water and they were ranked from like green to yellow to red and you would be very surprised how much red areas how many red areas they had in America um and we've already seen this a lot with um places where literally their aquifers completely just disappeared um if you do some searches for it you'll see you know um city now dry aquifers just magically dried up and they don't know why whether it was deep fissures in the ground beneath them just the water table suddenly dropped because all of that water sunk deeper into the core um there's really no explanation for it and of course on the flip side you have all these deep debunkers who talk about what's called primary water and they say well all of this is propaganda and there's an unlimited source of water yeah i was gonna ask yada, you about yada, that yada. i've had a guest on who actually just said that a couple months ago so your response to that is what jim <laughs> my response to that is prove it how are you gonna prove it um and, and and i mean the proof is in the pudding you know show me some data you know show me that there, that this is a fact. When I, you know, I'm, pro I probably should make a map at this point because I've heard of so many of these. And whenever I get into my mapping, I, I do maps on climateviewer.org. Um, I get really down and dirty, and I, I comb every single edge of the internet for these stories. Um, and I can think of probably thirty to forty different stories just that you know in passing because people i get so many emails and one of the problems is you know being a father having two daughters um both are in mixed martial arts going to private school you know my daughter's now into volleyball she just started um having a wife you know having so much responsibility and then trying to keep up with three websites and do interviews like this one um, it doesn't leave me a lot of time to even <laughs> respond to, you know, social media at all. I know that um, feeling. And, and yeah. And I mean, and then there's the emails and, you know, I try to respond to as many emails as possible, but there are a lot of people who just know, but they keep sending them cause they know that I'm reading them. Um, cause they see it, you know, like I'll, I'll thank them in a video and be like, this one really caught my eye. I really dug into this one. And, the China thing is one of the most recent ones. You know, I made a video on YouTube. Um, you could find me at Jim Lee Climate Viewer. Make sure you put Climate Viewer in there. You're going to get the comic book artist. Um, but I made a, a video on there. Um, China's geoengineering program of, is affecting the world's weather. And it was because of an email, you know, that was sent to me. So... I get so many of these emails and I, and I keep seeing this recurring theme of, you know, just an entire aquifer just disappears. And I mean, literally the whole city is running off of bottled water and you have to ask yourself, you know, well, well, who does this benefit and why is this happening? Is this, is this all by design? Is it just accidental? Is it, you know, just not well understood and natural, you know, like, you guys suck the well dry. Um, but then you start to dig into the, the history of weather control. And you realize that, you know, there have been some pretty pretty crazy things said about it. And, um, you know, the, the number one thing that just keeps ringing in my ear is Lyndon Johnson. And here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull it up real quick because, and I got it because... God bless weathermodificationhistory.com. Yes. Um, he, he really, he's he just, he's darn right creepy in the way he puts it. And he says, this was, um, and I want to, I want to actually tell you when this happened. This was, uh, when he was still a uh, vice president. This is 1962. It lays the predicate and foundation for the development of a weather satellite that will permit man to determine the world's cloud layer and ultimately to control the weather. And he who controls the weather will control the world. Now that, that 
that sounds pretty bad on the surface, but then let's really dig in even deeper because this next comment from Lyndon Johnson is darn right nefarious. Control of space means control of the world. From space, the masters of infinity would have the power to control the Earth's weather, to cause drought and flood, to change the tides and raise the levels of the sea, to divert the Gulf Stream and change temperate climates to frigid. To raise the levels of the sea? That sounds a lot like climate change to me. I thought that they were saying CO2 was doing that. But Lyndon Johnson here, um, with his big boy pants on, was saying, wait, if we can control space, then we can control the weather. And if we can control the weather, then we can make droughts and floods and raise the level of the sea. This was back in 1960s, guys. I mean, yeah. it, it, it's like grab people by the shoulder wake up and if you thought he wasn't serious Lyndon Johnson went on to do weather warfare in Vietnam and it was called Operation Popeye many people um, who are familiar with the topic have heard of that it was also um, after Jack Anderson reported it in the New York Times, quickly renamed to Operation Intermediary Compatriot and Operation Motor Pool. So, of course, they quickly flipped the script and said, no, don't talk about Popeye anymore. It's now called this. Oh, crap, they found out about that. Now call it this. But it all still came out in the end, and Russia um, wasn't too keen on the idea either. So, after long debating it with Russia and having U.S. congressional hearings on the matter in the 1970s, by 1978, um, they signed the Environmental Modification Convention Treaty, which basically banned weather warfare. So, for those who think that we're just wearing tinfoil hats over here, look up NMOD, E-N-M-O-D. Because if the United Nations signed a, you know, agreement between all nations to ban weather warfare because Henry Kissinger, the CIA, and about 17 individuals from the U.S. Air Force um, and the U.S. Navy did weather warfare over Vietnam, and they did it without anybody knowing the Secretary of Defense didn't even know that they were doing. That's how top secret this was. You can only imagine in today's world how much technology has improved since then. And if you think that some piece of paper in a vault at the UN headquarters that says you shouldn't do weather warfare is going to stop them from doing it, um, you really have your head in the sand. As early as um, June of 2018, Iran accuses Israel of cloud theft. That Iran, a uh, brigadier general from Iran, said that Israel and other um, surrounding co countries were stealing their rain and diverting their clouds. This sounds a lot like Operation Nile Blue, Project Nile Blue, where the CIA was also doing the same thing to Fidel Castro. They called it a rain embargo. And the idea was to do cloud seeding in the Gulf of Mexico and guarantee that the rain never fell on the island of Cuba, causing their sugar crops to fail. So the technology to, to keep rain from falling has been around for a long time. Again, this was the, the late 1960s when they did um, Project Nile Blue and, and were screwing with the sugar crops in Cuba. But you can then go to the Chernobyl incident um, in the 1980s. And Moscow didn't want 
the radioactive fallout from Chernobyl to fall, you know, in their capital. So what did they do? They sent planes out, um, and they basically did a whole lot of cloud seeding over Belarus. If you look at the radioactive fallout, which you can see on climateviewer.org, you can actually see a 3D overlay of you know the radioactivity levels around the Chernobyl reactor and in Belarus, that they were able to make most of that nuclear cloud rain on Belarus before it ever reached Moscow. And that's called a washout or a rain embargo. It's a, it's a form of overseeding the sky. So you put so many cloud seeds into the sky that you basically use up all of the available water vapor. So it's either going to fall or it's going to get to a point where there are so many particulates in the sky that there's not enough water to coalesce on those seeds to get big enough to make raindrops, and then there's no rain. So that's two ways that they used um, rain embargoes or, you know, cloud seeding to stop rainfall. And those are well documented. You, you can't run away from it. It's history, and those who forget the past are doomed to repeat it. So we get back to China, and China hoarding all of the water because, you know, when you've got a billion people and most of them are in the north and most of their rainfall occurs in the south, they're using, you know, what they're calling the north-south dam uh, water. I have it. I have it. But let me, let me be accurate about this. Uh, it's called the south-north water diversion project in combination with what's called the Tiani um, project. So the, the South North Water Diversion Project is kind of like what they're doing with Arizona. You know, that they're taking these tributaries that are coming off the Himalayas and then using dams and locks and all of that sort of thing to then take that water from the south and move it to the north where all the population is. Um, and the, the Tiani project, they're using satellites and, you know, all of the glaciogenic snowpack augmentation, ground-based cloud seeding generators to, to create artificial snow all over the Tibetan plateau. And then they're hoarding it for themselves. India's mad. <laughs> Vietnam is mad. Um, you know, everybody in the area, they're mad, and there's there's very little they can do against such a superpower. Jim Lee, my guest, and we'll continue this program into the next hour on Into the Paranormal. I'm Jeremy Scott. Linda Johnson, 1962. We're the the foundation for the development of our other satellite. That will permit man to become the world's cloud layer. And Exploring the possibilities of the subjects you've always wanted to know and those you never knew existed until now. Into the Pair of Normal with Jeremy Scott.
Continuing our conversation, Jim Lee of ClimateViewer.com and .org, WeatherModificationHistory.com. Those are really the websites where you can find all of the information, much of which he's referenced tonight. And I want to give a shout-out to uh, Dominic as well in our Facebook chat, who's doing a good job of uh, sharing those links uh, so that we can get that information and check it out ourselves. And so uh, we've been talking about uh, China, and then during the break, uh, Jim sent me this thing about Russia's doing this cloud seeding. And so is the biggest threat of this weather control from our foreign adversaries? Jim? Hello, Jim. I think Jim's just on a, he's taking a dinner break is probably what he's doing right now. Um, (laughs) But there's definitely uh, evidence that other countries are are doing this. We we heard a clip in the last half hour uh, about China doing that. And, of course, you also heard uh, the clip from Lyndon B. Johnson back in 1962 stating in which if you can control the weather, you can control the world. And um, it does seem that, that that's what we're dealing with with uh, right now at this at this point in time. And so I'm uh, interested to get uh, Jim's take on that. Uh, the temperature's gone down a bit here. Um, it, it, we're, not, we're not dealing with uh, anything too extreme at this point in time. It's just a consecutive you know, day upon day, and there's a lot of people who are vulnerable in this situation. I know there has been at least one death in this heat wave. And, of course, Oregon had about 100 heat wave deaths uh, in June, and so did other states. Jimmy, back with us? Yeah, can you hear me now? I can. So uh, tell us what uh, the question was, since Russia is doing this cloud seeding as well. And, of course, these are just uh, you know some of the geoengineering op- uh, operations that are going on. There are many more. Uh, is the biggest threat to weather modification or control here in the U.S. coming from our foreign adversaries? that that's the number one question on everybody's mind and my answer to that is we have no idea and that is why i am pushing a solution called the environmental modification accountability act um the difference between myself and i would say every other single person talking about weather control either on youtube or websites or wherever is that I believe that information without direction is infotainment and I want to be pragmatic about this. And since I've been spent over a decade, you know, nerding out, learning all this stuff, I figured I probably better come up with a solution. And I think the solution, you know, it, it's obviously going to be a twofold thing because one, I really don't trust the United Nations. Um, they're kind of useless. But they do already have a law on the books banning weather warfare. The problem is they never made a way to catch somebody doing it. And the reason I bring this up is because when we were having the nuclear arms race and 2053 nuclear bombs went off worldwide, you can see all of those on my map. Um, climbviewer.org. You can see all 2,053 nuclear tests um, done around the world. They said this is getting kind of out of hand once we started doing, we being the United States, doing Starfish Prime, um, Hardtack, and a bunch of other ones. And then it wasn't until the Russians did Project K where they blew up a nuclear bomb in space that people started to get concerned. So there were about six or seven major nuclear explosions in space that sparked the limited test ban treaty. And so again, you know, the world came together and said, you know what, we need to ban um, upper atmospheric nuclear explosions. Um, But we also need to know 
if people are doing it, if they're breaking, you know, the law. Um, just one moment. Jim Lee with us on Into the Paranormal, by the way, and his links, climateviewer.com, climateviewer.org, weathermodificationhistory.com, and he's got a YouTube uh, channel. We do have the links up in the episode page uh, at paranormalradio.com. Go ahead, Jim. Yeah, thank you for that. And um, so, so they, they passed the limited test ban treaty, and then they said, well, we need to be able to verify. Trust but verify, Ronald Reagan said. Um, we need to verify whether or not people are breaking this agreement. So what did they do? They created the International Monitoring System, and it's run by the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty Organization, CTBTO. Um, and what they do is they actually have seismographs around the world, all around the world, infrasound recorders. Infrasound is sound below our ability to hear, but it is created every time a nuclear bomb goes off. So between these and, you know, satellite imagery, all of these combined into a sensor network to be able to tell when North Korea is blowing up a nuclear bomb, even though it's banned. Um, and that's really the way we need to go with the weather warfare ban. The problem is the world really lacks the technology to be able to detect if somebody's doing geoengineering. We could probably detect if people were dumping large amounts of chemicals into the sky if we had rainfall um, sampling equipment worldwide. It's one of the proposals in my Environmental Modification Accountability Act. Um, is to create a sensor network to detect weather warfare. And it's a two-part system, one being ver notification before atmospheric experimentation. You have to notify an international registry of atmospheric experimentation um, at least 48 hours before you modify the weather because it, you know it's an industry. It's a multi-billion dollar, if not trillion dollar industry now. Um, with companies like Weather Modification Inc., um, Western Weather Consultants, the United Arab Emirates is literally running, you know, two and five million dollar prizes for whoever can make it rain in the desert out there because uh, they got that oil money. Um, so weather modification, trying to ban it as a whole is not a realistic goal. So you got to start somewhere. Let's at least ban nefarious weather modification and hold accountability for people who modify the weather um, so that if you go and you tamper with the storm to make it rain and then you destroy this man's farmland, mm -hmm. um, that he can take you into a court of law and hold you accountable. So if you're going to modify the weather, tell you got a worldwide requirement, every, every country, you got to tell us 48 hours before you do it. If you modify the weather and you didn't tell us you were going to do it and we catch you, we can assume you were up to no good, i.e. weather warfare. How do we catch people doing it? That's the real question. So similar to what we did with the nuclear explosions, we create an international monitoring system to monitor rainfall patterns or, or rainfall constituents. So if we see massive amounts of silver iodide, carbon black dust, there are many chemicals that are common to weather modification worldwide um, that are in common use, um, that if we see electromagnetic emissions, ELF waves, um, there are many different types, cloud ionization, odd ionization patterns in the clouds. Um, that if we see these things, that it, it you know kicks off some alarms. It says, "Hey, we need to look into this. What planes are flying in this area? Are they unmarked? You know, CIA planes? Are they U.S. Air Force planes? Are they Russian planes? Are they Chinese? The Philippines, the the military of the Philippines handles their you know weather modification projects." Um, and obviously in China, the Chinese military PLA, 
Um, they do all of the weather modification. They did the weather modification for the Beijing Olympics in um, 2008. And their whole goal was to try to stop rain from falling on the Olympics. They, they failed miserably, but they were doing everything from shooting rockets into the sky to pouring liquid nitrogen out of the back of planes. Um, but how do we tell the difference between that and weather warfare? And like I said, you know, you would create an international monitoring system, so you would get all of the universities and all of the instruments that are from NASA, the the Japanese Himawari projects, you know, every single instrument, the European, EU, METSAT, um, and combine them together. And guess what? I still don't trust it. So the whole goal of the, the word climate viewer came from this idea that we would create a climate viewer for your backyard that you could buy an instrument that you could put in your backyard that would measure the rain falling on your backyard or falling on your farm and then stream that data live to the internet, live to a map like Climate Viewer Maps, Climate Viewer 3D, ClimateViewer.org that we could see in real time well, there sure is a lot of aluminum falling on these three states. That there's a lot of silver iodide concentrated in this area. That hurricane coming in from the Gulf just got a lot of carbon black dust dumped into it. And these were the flights in the area at the time. Um, it would be very complicated to do, but it's a necessity because in reality... A hurricane is approximately 400 nuclear bombs worth of energy per second. So we're talking about some of the most powerful, you know, entities on the planet and that people want to control them for nefarious reasons. So to answer your question, the question can only be answered by, you know, improving our ability to gather data. And, you know, of course you're going to have your, your, your doomsayers, your fear porn um, pushers who are out there on the internet who say, well, we know for certain because of whistleblowers and all of this. And they're always anonymous there. It's, it's an anonymous whistleblower from the U S air force or something like that. And I'm not going to name any names, but there, there are many people out there who, claim a lot of BS and they're not pragmatic. They don't have any solutions. And I believe this is the only solution that not only has been put forward, but has even been accepted by the top two geoengineers on the planet. Uh, Ken Caldera and David Keith have both read my proposal and said, you know, this is something that we could, you know, agree to because it needs to happen. The Dr. Jim Fleming, the world's top historian on weather modification, he said, I think that what you're doing is very important and could change the world. So I think that I've really stumbled onto a solution that will benefit man. You know, my grand, great grandchildren might be able to see the stars one day that people won't be able to control the clouds and make solar power not a thing that we can actually rest easy knowing that the weather over our head was made naturally and not by man. And by having a citizen powered network of sensors to augment and fact check the government sensors, they cannot be turned off. Um, the EPA's RADNET, the Radiation Detection Network, um, was turned off whenever the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear meltdown occurred in 2011. What good is a government sensor network that's supposed to alert the public if they're just going to shut it off when it's needed most? And that, they, of course, their whole rationale is, 
well, we're shutting it off because we don't want a lot of public fear. But that's unacceptable. Um, we have to have a citizen a citizen powered network um, to fact check the fact checkers. And I think that that's really the solution going forward. Um, you can read my entire proposal at climateviewer.com slash nmod. That's E-N-M-O-D, climateviewer.com slash nmod. It's the Environmental Modification Accountability Act. And the idea is to take this law that's already on the books and give it some teeth and give it some verification. Um, and then beyond that, go on a state-by-state, state, local level and do the same thing. Write laws about this. Um, raise awareness about this. And hopefully that we will get to a place where um, there is transparency in an industry that has been going on for over 100 years. And people have no clue about it. Um, even Greta Thunberg believe it or not, just recently came out and said no to geoengineering. Now, regardless of what you think about her politics or her beliefs on global warming, even a child, when explained, do you think it's a good idea to create an artificial volcano using planes, rockets, and balloons, possibly satellites, to dump chemicals into the stratosphere. Now, these chemicals could be aluminum, sulfur, titanium, um, even diamond dust, but most likely sulfur. That's our favorite. Um, that if we dump these chemicals into the stratosphere and block some sunlight, that we could save the planet from global warming. Do you think that's a good idea? Every child I've ever asked that to immediately says no. Every um, political figure, whether they're on the right or the left, they say no. Um, every public um, perception management poll that the climate engineers themselves have put out have come back, you know, positively no. Yet they continue to push on Harvard uh, University has the Harvard Solar Geoengineering Program with David Keith at the helm and um, Frank Koich. And they're doing what's called SCOPEX. And their idea is, and it's funded by Bill Gates, um, to float a balloon into the stratosphere and spray some chemicals and then see how much sunlight they block. And they tried to first launch a balloon in Arizona um, yeah, I believe in 2019, they weren't able to do that. So then in 2020, they were trying to launch it um, in Sweden. And, of course, the ETC group, who runs geoengineeringmonitor.org, um, they came out once again and stopped a second geoengineering project uh, by gathering non-governmental organizations from around the world to say, this is lunacy. Stop it. Stop what you're doing. Get some help. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, before that, it was the SPICE project, the Stratospheric Particle Injection for Climate Engineering Project, which is a marine cloud brightening project that was going to happen in the UK. The ETC group um, stopped that one as well. So if you're looking for somebody out there who's actually, you know, doing something about this, um, they're actually, you know, they're batting two for two. You know what I mean? They're, they're batting 100 um, percent. But that doesn't that doesn't handle our CIA problem. That doesn't happen. Handle our KGB, PLA, you know, governmental problem where it's a secret program. So the only solution for those are like what I'm talking about with the Environmental Modification Accountability Act to actually gather the data necessary to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt. Somebody dumped chemicals in the sky. Somebody modified this weather for nefarious intentions. Let's get to the bottom of it. Um, it's amazing to me that Jack Anderson 
learned about Operation Popeye simply by seeing a memo that was laying on Lyndon Johnson's desk. If he hadn't have seen that sheet of paper sitting on Lyndon Johnson's desk, we would not even know about the weather warfare in Vietnam. And that would we would not have a weather warfare ban um, to this day. So I think that alone is pretty amazing. Um, and hopefully, you know, that we don't have this recurring theme. You know, like I, like I like to say, um, just that there are so many people who are completely clueless about this topic. Um, and, and they're so concerned about climate change, yet they don't know anything about the climate changers. And so, Jim, are you saying that um, we can get out of this with laws? Is, is that what you're saying here? The law, a, a law is a sheet of paper. And I mean, people break, the, murder is illegal. Does that stop people from shooting each other? No. Um, but when we're talking about on a, a governmental level and we're talking about, um, shout out to my boy, Dominic. I see, I, I, I had to, I've been in the background trying to get to the chat. <laughs> um, Dominic is, uh, my brother from another mother from Canada. Um, why anybody would leave in, live in Canada? I don't understand. You you guys are crazy. Um, but you're gonna make a few enemies Dominic, then because we got lots of Canadians listening tonight. Oh man, it's no. I have so many friends in Canada. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> um, I, I just I you know my brief stint in um, Omaha, Nebraska, and Bend, Oregon. Me and Snow don't agree. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. Um, but Dominic actually put together 845 newspaper articles that go all the way back to the 1800s and put them into a single image so that you can see that. Um, and I think it's phenomenal um, whenever I go through the material on weathermodificationhistory.com. And I encourage everybody, especially if you're there, go and click on the newspapers link. Um, because what you're going to see very quickly in reading these is that there used to be honest journalism, and that stopped somewhere in the 80s. Hold that thought, Jim Lee of Climate Viewer News. I'm Jeremy Scott into the paranormal, continuing weathering the storm tonight.
Repair Abnormal News, I'm Brad Bernards. In a study released Wednesday, NASA researchers used precision tracking data from the agency's OSIRIS-REx spacecraft to better understand movements of the potentially hazardous asteroid Bennu through the year 2300. Dan Gallagher, producer and writer on NASA's tour of asteroid Bennu, talks about what we've learned about Bennu over the past three years. OSIRIS-REx greatly improved our knowledge of Bennu's position, density, thermal inertia, and other properties that can influence how its orbit will evolve over time. The new data allowed scientists to significantly reduce uncertainties in Bennu's predicted orbit, ruling out a number of keyholes for the 2135 flyby and eliminating several future impact scenarios. NASA is planting the seeds for a fully autonomous exploration on Mars. Pair Abnormal News correspondent Daniel Brewer digs deep. A new project by NASA and Boston Dynamics called Braille is training fully autonomous robots to explore deep caves like the ones that you would find on Mars to help shape future missions. Using a robot named Spot, the hope is to produce 3D maps of the interior of caves and collect information about the environment. Jennifer Blank, lead scientist for the Braille project, speaks about its durability. What's so exciting about Spot is how flexible it is and how maneuverable it is. I can envision scenarios where it has you know, different spots have their own assigned robots and their own science specialties. It opens up so many possibilities for how you could deploy it on another planet. Caves are said to be one of the most likely places to find signs of life on other planets because they're capable of protecting life from cosmic rays and extreme temperature fluctuations around our solar system. For Paranormal News, this is Daniel Brewer. Somewhere between abnormal and paranormal. I'm Brad Bernards, Paranormal News. Large parts of the United States and Canada are experiencing a heat wave that is shattering countless high temperature records. No matter what we do, our future is going to be warmer. We are going to see climate change that is now locked in, effects that cannot be undone. Tornadoes increasing in intensity and frequency. 211 tornadoes across 17 states and 316 people lost their lives in a single day. Tornadoes in places they're normally not. In Utah. It's scary outside right now. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Controlling the weather is the ultimate super weapon. It's even more powerful than the atomic bomb. The weather's on steroids. What's really the truth? Into the paranormal, separating fact from fiction. Weathering the storm with Jim Lee tonight into the paranormal. I'm Jeremy Scott. Jim's website's climateviewer.com, climateviewer.org, weathermodificationhistory.com. You were talking about journalism and particularly that uh, it kind of went south right around, you say, the 80s uh, on this topic of weather control. And uh, why do you think that was? Well, I mean, th there was, I think it was called the, the, the Fairness Doctrine or something like that, the equal time uh, requirements for the FCC. Um, and, of course, this gave birth to you know people like Rush Limbaugh. Um, and then that's when talk radio really took off there. Before, there were requirements that, you know, if you were going to have somebody who was a Republican on the show, that you give equal time to a Democrat. Um, and I think, you know, with that going out the window, um, they're, they're really, it opened the floodgates for people to just have more commentary. Um, and that became wildly popular in addition to the fact that people started to realize the power of propaganda. Now, of course, propaganda, people, propagandists have known this for centuries. Um, but I think that really a lot of the major, um, you know, legacy media companies have recognized that, you know, there's more money in it for them to tell the right side of the story. And by right, I don't mean Republican, 
um, their version of the story. Um, because telling just the truth, black and white, you know, facts from fiction, um, it isn't popular anymore. I mean, people aren't interested in hearing facts that go against their beliefs. Um, one of my favorite sayings ever, which is on every single page on climateviewer.com is, um, from Carl Sagan. And he said, one of the saddest lessons of history is this. If we've been bamboozled long enough, we tend to reject any evidence of the bamboozle. We're no longer interested in finding out the truth. The bamboozle has captured us. It's simply too painful to acknowledge even to ourselves that we've been taken. Once you give a charlatan power over you, you almost never get it back. But that one line stands out for me. It's simply too painful to acknowledge even to ourselves that we've been taken. And I think that that's the, the number one reason why news is so slanted today. Um, because people, you know, they had, they're, they're so ingrained, they're so tribalistic, um, that they don't really want to hear the opposing side anymore. Yeah. And I mean, this is evident in, especially in politics where you see speakers going to colleges being shouted down, um, that if you wear a MAGA hat, you get beat over the head, um, you know, that, that people who have differing opinions, it's now okay to use violence against them. This is why on YouTube, whenever I make videos, at the end of every single video I make, I say attack ideas, not people. And the reason I say that is because it seems to be lost. You know, the, the, the idea of debate, civil debate, has just slowly withered away. And people aren't interested in the truth. They're only interested in their truth, whatever the hell that means. Um, and I, there is no your truth, my truth. Now, of course that can be argued because to a person who's indoctrinated in radical Islam, um, you know, they would say that because a book told me it is okay for me to stone my wife in public because she had an affair and to them, they're the good guy. She's the bad guy. But to another person who's an outside observer, they would say, no, you're the bad guy. She's a victim. So is that objective truth? The fact remains that there are fundamental truths, and they're not really well covered by the media anymore. Um, and I can't fully explain why there seemed to me a plethora <laughs> Hefe, would you say that there was a plethora of weather modification articles before 1980? See, si, El Wapo. <laughs> um, and, but there were, and they're becoming harder and harder to find. Except that now whenever I browse the internet and I get these daily updates and I get these emails you more and more have to read between the lines. You have to realize that there's a person on the other end with an, usually with an agenda. And that's the sad part about it is we don't really have these people who are willing to speak truth to power, um, to, to, to say just the facts, despite how it's going to make, you know, as one famous individual said, facts don't care about your feelings. Um, I don't care about your feelings. You can love me, like me, hate me, troll me. Um, I just care about the truth when it comes to this topic. And there are other topics I talk about, um, you know, microwave weaponry, you know, propaganda is obviously a big one, mind control using words, uh, slave speak. And I think that the, the commonality of it is that Word control and mind control is rampant in the news media today. Mm -hmm. And when you have what I like to call the Silicon Mafia, um, 
which you're currently streaming on, <laughs> uh, <laughs> that that literally can shadow ban anybody, which uh, I, I just did a test um, because I wanted to see. I noticed that I have 2,711 friends on Facebook. I shared your live stream. And I noticed that you were the only person who had responded to it with a like. So, of course, I locked out. I threw on my VPN briefly. Um, I logged into my fake Facebook account. And that post does not exist. You can see it. I can see it. It's not there. Um, Now, a couple of my other conspiracy-related shadow band friends may be able to see it. But if they share it to their wall, that too is also only visible by the people who have been thrown into the sandbox. Well, Jim, interesting you should bring that up because I wasn't going to get on the censorship topic tonight. But it's been very interesting since we've been posting about topics, COVID-related and other topics. Uh, we have we have taken a significant hit uh, in the amount of traffic, the amount of views. Uh, the amount of people it, it's reaching, it's just not getting out there. Um, and we're having to do paid promotions just to try to reach the same amount of people that we did once before. So it's there's got to be a better way. Cabal. Because pay, it, it, it's like it's like paying the slave master to allow you to eat dinner. Um. When they're the one that actually has you in bondage, giving them money to to artificially inflate your numbers isn't the solution. The solution is to make them a ghost, to make them a thing of the past. And, you know, as a person who's been doing this for over a decade, when I started out in, let's say, the year 2000, um... I was getting around 60 to 100,000 hits per day on climateviewer.com. Today, it averages 500 to 1,000. And it's uh, it's really a defeating, somewhat depressing feeling to know that there are so many controls put on the Internet, Google being the number one biggest threat to a free society we currently have because they are um, the ministry of truth that was, you know, warned about in 1984. And this ministry of truth built from the Silicon mafia um, is really needs to be reined in or destroyed. That which can be destroyed by truth should be. I I stand by those words, I live by those words, and I used to hack by those words. Um <laughs> I mean honestly, like I was a ha- I was I was a hacker from the age of 11. Well, I am you didn't le- you didn't learn old. how to code websites from uh, just out of thin air. No, I I taught myself that to <laughs> because at some point Talking about a map and being able to show them that that map is two totally different things. A picture may yeah. be worth a thousand words, but a map's got to be worth a couple million. Um, so, so, you know, I really think that the Silicon Mafia is really part of the reason why, you know, modern day media is just dead. Modern day news is dead. I mean, I, I would I would venture to say that eighty percent of these people at these you know three letter agencies, uh, CNN, FOX, uh, you know, pick your poison. Um, they don't really send anybody out into the field to do anything anymore. Um, they rely on you know third party sources, anonymous sources. Um, I would venture to say that there are at least multiple CIA and FBI operators at every single one of these outlets. Um, so we're in a place where, you know, all of these news outlets have now been centralized. There's six companies that basically run all of them. And it, therefore it's much easier to control, control the flow of data. And, 
the internet blew that wide open, but they, they, they quickly clamped down on that and they're clamping down more and more every single year. So it's, it's incumbent on the programs like yours and, and, and people like me coming onto these programs. And I'm sure that there well, are many people who've come onto your show that want to tell their truth. And I, and I just want it's to say just, here, that's why we have so many layers to this program. It may be redundant. We post video versions of this program. We post just straight audio podcast versions of this program. Then we have another uh, version that goes out just to uh, subscribers with, with no commercials, uh, a separate uh, uh file that goes up to the regular podcast and the most important part of them all is the terrestrial signal because with terrestrial radio we're able to get this information out there there's nobody censoring it nobody's blocking the signal this information's getting out there and it's living out there and hopefully resonating with the people and that's why my nickname is resonated <laughs> r-e-z-n-a-d you can find me on twitter steam my uh, every video game i ever played you know my nickname has been resonated since i was about 20 years old even when i was a hacker you and seem i kept like the, the same kind of, handle you seem like the kind of guy you'd be cool to get together with and uh, play a video game with oh man you want to play some call of duty i'm all about it um <laughs> can i bring my wife yeah sure my wife is a beast <laughs> <laughs> Um, she's been out scoring me lately cause I've been slacking playing a little Fortnite. So she, she never ah. stopped playing Warzone. And, but yeah, um, he, he, that's how I blow off my steam. You know, this is a very stressful job and a, a lot of times you feel like you have the weight of the world on your shoulders. Um, but you, you know, especially with summertime, kids are home. Um, they just started school this week. So I'm starting to kick back into high gear, trying I've been working on weathermodificationhistory.com for a year now, revamping it so it'll be Google Scholar friendly. Um, it's a much improved version of it coming soon. Um, but, you know, you have to do all this stuff and think of it like uh, it, it kind of broke my heart, but it also gave me hope. Um, I was listening to, you know, activists from the past and how they succeeded. And one of them, and I can't remember who, said, it's unrealistic to expect that in your lifetime you will change the world. But know that through your perseverance that the generations that follow will pick up that torch and they may cross the finish line. So we have to think of this as a marathon and not a sprint. And, you know, they another famous quote that I love is there are those who fight for a day and they are good and there are those who fight for a week or more and they are better but there are those who fight all the days of their lives and they are indispensable and I think that that's you know like at some point during this past decade I've realized that this is something I'm going to do for the rest of my life come hell or high water Come shadow band or not, um, I'm going to take it one day at a time and keep plowing forward with this. And I hope that everybody in the sound of my voice that hears this show, if you don't take anything away from it, understand that, you know, we're coming into a world where, you know, the BBC is literally predicting that in by 2050, our children will not be able to see the stars. And that's because whenever a artificial blanket <laughs> created by geoengineers, controlled by some scientific bureaucracy that's unelected, that determines the world's cloud layer, as Lyndon Johnson said, um, whenever that's a reality, there's no going back. Once you give up essential liberty uh, for temporary salvation, um, you never get it back. And once you believe the bamboozle long enough, you also never get it back. So you have to, you have to get pe people to understand this is something that's important. Why is it important to me? And why should I even, you know, what can I do? What can someone small like me do? And I remind them that Margaret Mead said, Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. So 
I hope that my small group of climate viewers can contribute to changing the world. Will it happen in my lifetime? I sure hope so. Man, that will be the greatest day ever. Um, but at the very least, I'll know that I did my my best to try to bring this real hidden world, something that's been going on for a hundred years. I know that Dominic has de- dedicated a large portion of his life to, I, because I'm a graphics artist as well. I know how hard it is to take a Google newspaper and turn that into a single image, beautiful piece of artwork that anybody can share anywhere. And we are archiving this history so that you have all of the proof you need to go to your congressman, to raise hell wherever you can about this topic. Because if you don't, we're going to get into a demolition man, another movie reference, a world where they say, you know, Jeremy, your podcast and all those lights and the equipment that you have, um, you were running the AC kind of hard that night. You have used too much energy today. And in order for you to achieve a balanced load, we're going to cut your air conditioning and internet off for the next four hours. Be well. And that's what the technocrats and technocracy is all about. Creating a one world government. That's what I mean. Energy. As I said at the beginning, energy of the... is the yeah is the the monetary unit, and that unelected bureaucrats run the world through the scientific method and with policies and procedures. Now, if you want to live in that world, then you really got your head far in your anus. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Jim, in the final minutes we have, tell us about uh, all of your projects. Well, like I said, I, I, you know, my, my websites have gone kind of stale, and I'm trying to fight the Google al- algorithm. I've found a weakness in the dragon's armor, and I am desperately working my way through uh, basically removing every external link from my website that you know, I, my, I'm big on references. So I have on uh, weathermodificationhistory.com, I have around 9,800 external links to references, reference material. And as I go through these links and I see that the website's either been deleted or it's now been bought up by Chinese hackers, um, I have to go through and find them on archive.org and update the links and everything. Well, Google kind of frowns on that sort of thing. So on top of the shadow banning, um, they, they'll, they'll put you in a, a bad place to where nobody can find your material because you're now linking to all these dead links. So I've got to update everything. So new updates come into climateviewer.com, climateviewer.org, weathermodificationhistory.com. New videos coming regularly. Um, it's going to be a crazy uh, winter. Let's um, not make it two years before we talk again because you're a wealth of knowledge, Jim Lee. Thank you so much for coming on the program tonight. Love you mean it, brother. All right. That's, Stay uh, vigilant. Yeah, it's Jim Lee. Amazing talk tonight, and thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in. We shall do it again next week. You know the time, you know the place. From the cold, dark depths of a secret dungeon somewhere deep in the remote Pacific Northwest. Good night, everyone. Today.